Okay, so without further ado, uh, can I hand over to your chair for this morning? And that's Councillor Denise Scott MacDonald, who's the Deputy Leader of Greenwich Council. Denise, over to you. Denise is on mute. Sam, can we unmute Denise, please? Hold on. One second. Sam, are you online? Okay, I think I'm on mute now. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, Go ahead, yeah. Denise. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. It's the world <coughs> we live in now, isn't it? We're, we're constantly muting and unmuting ourselves. Anyway, um, thank you, everybody that's here today. And um, it's an extraordinary time um, to be, have Black History Month online. Normally, we would have this event either in the town hall or in the Woolwich Library. Uh, we'd be hugging each other. We'd be, there'd be no social distance and there'll be lots of food too. Um, and um, and uh, uh, lots of time I'd get a chance to have some Jamaican food too. So, but not this year. Um, the whole thing is online, uh, as you all know, because of COVID, uh, which is quite sad. But it doesn't stop us. Um, it's really important that we continue to celebrate and continue to celebrate who we are uh, as a borough, but um, celebrate our diversity as a borough. Um, also, I just want to send apologies for Danny thought the leader of the council he would love to be here but he had a quite a serious operation this week and uh, he is out of service for the next few days and he's currently right now resting at home he just um came back from the hospital yesterday um but our black history month will not only just celebrate amazing achievements heritage art culture and music in our society and local communities but it will aim to embed black history in our everyday life um, which is why the campaign has those extra words, not just Black History Month, but BHM365, a celebration of achievement. 365 days for every day of the year. And I think it's important that we do not just leave it just to this month, which I think is very special, but we also celebrate it and find time for it every single day. In support of this, the council has created a uh, Black History Month funding opportunity to a number of local organisations to create a range of cultural events with a focus on showcasing artists, discovering new talents and connecting our Black history with our wider community. Nine organisations were awarded funding. Look out for them um, uh, on the website, but also throughout the day you may also hear from them and it's quite exciting. But let's just talk about a little bit, some more serious things um, about why we are, we are here. Uh, one of the things that's had a dramatic effect on our lives is COVID. Um, it's had a devastating effect on the country, but more so on our community. I don't know about you, but at the beginning of COVID, when those news stories came out and they had the pictures of the people that died and the first few pictures, my heart sank. And then the next day they showed the next lot of pictures and one by one, as I saw the pictures, I said, oh my God, doesn't anyone see that they are disproportionately um, BME people, black people, people in my community. And then gradually the roar and the noise began to let us out and people start to say, you know, there's something going on here. And my initial observation turned out to be accurate. Across the country, a disproportionate higher number of BME people were dying from the disease much higher than the normal of the regular population. We know that the reasons are many, but are often down to inequality. Not only that this year, we saw the awful death of George Floyd in America, an unarmed black man killed by police in America. His awful death, which was captured on video, unleashed a movement across the United States and then the rest of the world, including here in Britain. His agonizing last words, I can't breathe, were uttered loudly in every corner of this planet. And protesters and street protesters were shouting those words, saying, I can't breathe. This incident has caused us to seriously reflect on redressing the many layers of inequalities around race that exist and are caused by the deep rooted inequalities across employment, education, housing, opportunity, health, and so many areas. As a borough, we have long been working towards building a more equitable society. 
and we're not perfect and we're still on that journey and we're working as hard as we can and some may argue we need to work far faster i know sometimes i feel like i want to work faster in 2016 we launched the fairness commission the recommendations from the report became part of our social mobility agenda a cross-department campaign within the council to address some of the key challenges which leads to our inequality in 2018 we commissioned the running league trust an independent organization that looks carefully at topics like this to a and it did a deep dive into race inequality in the borough and made recommendations in the race equality scorecard for Greenwich which reported in October 2019. In London only five boroughs have undertaken this kind of scorecard work. In January we started a further journey to research more about what makes our workplace, schools, health system, housing and communities more equal, which led to equality and equitable charter that Adele will talk about later. The Black Lives Matter campaign was, has focused, helped us to focus our minds like never before on the importance of what we are doing and why we need to be more effective and find more effective solutions to dealing with a deep rooted problem. Here in Greenwich, here are some, some, some stats or, or figures. Um, on health, the BME community are disproportionately impacted by poor underlying health conditions, including hypertension, smoking and diabetes. On housing, 65% of BME families are living in multi-generational households compared with 30% of the population. Now, I mean, I grew up in a multi-generational household when I was very young. We lived with my grandparents until my parents could afford to move to, um, to their own place. But some of the data here is pointed more to inequality. Uh, that's deep line in so many of our, uh, of our communities. Unemployment, this is quite an interesting thing. 49% of staff at Lucian and Greenwich NHS Trust are from BMA communities and even higher rates are on temporary agency staff, um, which shows some of the impact of COVID and how it impacts on staff. But if we look at education, just carefully, education is important to tackling inequality, as a mechanism of social mobility, as a vehicle of social and cultural integration. The Ranimi Trust, which I mentioned early on with her scorecard, highlighted some of the things that we as a borough need to do to make our educational system much more equal for all of our children. In Greenwich, we know that our focus on improving our primary school and, and levels of achievement at Key Stage 2 has not been replicated as successfully in our secondary schools, especially for young black children. At Key Stage 2, most Black Caribbean and Black African pupils perform at national and above national level. However, in Key Stage 4, the picture changes quite dramatically. The attainment gap widens and it suggests that ethnic inequality in attainment intensifies further you go along in the school system. Many of our schools are using all tools at their disposal to provide the right support to children to help raise academic standards across all our schools. All this will unlock so many of our barriers children face, but it isn't straightforward and there are many parallels challenged to overcome, including poverty, poor housing, worklessness and a lack of role models. And COVID hasn't made it any, any easier for us. The impact of many months homeschooling has had a disproportionate impact on children in larger families and more disadvantaged families without the means to support home learning. The government investment in catch-up support for the most disadvantaged children is welcome and we are working with our schools to identify the children most in need. Unfortunately, the money doesn't go far enough and we would like to be able to do more. We are working to overcome this. And we are working um, in, in all our different departments to overcome this. But I just want to end on hope before I pass on to my colleague, uh, Adele. You know, when I was growing up in Lucian, a, a little girl, um, I used to sometimes watch the videos of Martin Luther King, who was a civil rights leader. And I was always touched by I Have a Dream speech. And in his speech, he talked about the mountains coming down and the valleys raising up. And I just, believe that this continual journey that we are to address this is about that transforming our society and um, and I've always been active trying to work on inequalities issues throughout my career and as a councillor I do that all, all the time in the council. Yes Covid and George Floyd has helped us to focus more on that 
and I hope that this day will inspire us all to continue on the journey to tackle racial equality and to challenge and to be a part of uh, a better world that we are working towards. Just like Martin Luther King had a dream, I too have a dream for a better and greater and healthier and more equitable Greenwich. Anyway, thank you. That's it. <laughs> I don't, I don't. <laughs> it's so odd when you do it like this. <laughs> I can't see anyone's eyes. I can't, I can't see any context, but. Thank you, thank you, Denise. That was brilliant. Well done. Uh, first thing I would like to say, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. It's good to see so many familiar faces and partners that we have been working with for four years and I've been working with even longer. So thank you all for joining us. And definitely I can't for not say this morning, happy Nigerian Independence Day of 60 years of independency. Happy Nigerian Independence Day to all my Nigerian followers that's online today. I'll start off with a bit about my journey. To politics, I think it was the last thing that I ever decided, but I was a black year crossing two different stages and, you know, 90% nine, nine of the time I had to jump over the back fence to go home. So I don't get attacked in the morning or in the afternoon when I'm going to school. And it was then I decided that change needs to happen as a young man. And I got I went into I got myself involved in volunteering, volunteering as a youth worker, working with young people, you know, telling them there is hope out there. You know, regardless what your colour of your skin it is, you know, there's hope, there is better things to come. And we keep, you know, working hard, we will achieve it. And my journey began just going on helping young people went to uni you know graduated i was i was written off completely in school you know maybe because i never used to attend as good but went to uni done that and i continued my youth work and i decided one day i said oh, let me challenge these local politicians and let's see what they do for young people in the community and the community as a whole so i decided to join politics and i it's not the easiest thing you know there is inequalities in politics itself which is challenging and over years it will change as more you know being people join the council and become councillors it's really important that you encourage any young person that wants to join go ahead put your foot forward and join the council you can make a change and luckily enough in may this year i got elected as the cabinet member for communities culture and equalities and it was an interesting portfolio because it's something that I do on a day to day basis and I still do it at my day job. And I decided to start speaking to all the community organizations, finding out what, what is the challenging that we are facing as a community. And some of the things, uh, challenges that we are facing is the inequalities, you know, less representation, you know, our voices are not being heard. So, from there, I decided to put together with the team, with the hard work of all the team in the council, an equalities and equity charter that went out for consultation. And we had since then, we had over nearly 800 responses that came forward that all of them agree with our draft consultation on the, our draft being called equalities and equity charter. And the most important thing was a lot of people saying, what is gonna be underpinning your equality and equity charter? So we got the team working extremely hard to put, you know, measurable and accountable points together so that we are completely held accountable for everything that we put in our equalities and equity charter. But and that goes across the council, every department. And not only there, we are going to try to ask every single partner that we work with that sign up to this equality and equity charter. Make sure that, you know, people from the ethnic minority, you know, black and African people are, you know, valued as much as anybody else. Women are valued as much as everyone else. Disabled people are valued. Whichever your gender, you should be feel the same as everybody else. There shouldn't be no barriers regardless. So the team is working extremely hard to un put together the underpinning work that we can be held accountable for that. Since then as well, I had many Zoom meetings with many communities. I had Zoom meetings with the Nigerian community, with the Gambian community, with the Ghanaian community and so many other communities as well regarding what they want to see change in the council. A lot of these small organizations, you know, small groups that 
work hard day to day and the following day day time they were having a tough time putting together funding bids to help them to go forward and deliver more services for our residents so one of the things that we took from that uh, conversation is to go back and see if us as a council how can we support this so we are now going to be recruiting a bid writer to small to support small organizations in writing actual bids it's not about it's you know it's, it's not about sitting there and telling them what this is what needs to go into your bid no but actually explaining to them what goes to their bid and writing it on their behalf and making sure that they get some funding to help them stand on their feet and continue and from teach them the skills to continue going forward so we've got the team working on that there'll be an ad going out soon for a vacancy for a bid writer if you know any good bid writers please ask them to put their name forward apply we want to make sure that all our small organizations small community groups have the same ability of getting funding as our big organization so that that is in hand at the moment and in present and some of the other things that came up from the BAME conference that I had with the BAME community and the black community, uh, it was be the gap that there they should not be a middle organization or middle man that talks on behalf of the BAME community. And one of the things is that we decided that we are in the process of setting up as well is an advisory board, uh, a black and ethnic minority advisory board that talks directly to the leaders of the borough and says to them, looks at policies, you know, becomes a critical friend when it's needed, making sure that we are doing all the right things and not doing it only for a tick box exercise. All that time of tick box exercise is out the window as a council and long as I'm here, I will not accept any sort of tick box exercise in anything that we do and that is in process and the team is putting together and start recruiting organizations to be part of this so that is where we are with the advisory board and from there as well it was around black history month something that has never happened before in the council to put a part of We're losing you slightly. Your um, bandwidth to deliver the last minute Black History Month event this year, which is the first time they ever happened. And we have put out £35,000 for small organisations to bid in and showcase the heritage of our African community and applications that were put forward. It was very difficult to. Hello. Can we you hear me now? Hear you, Adele. Um, if I turn off my quite badly in the last two minutes, do you mind um, going back to the bit talking about um, the, the fundraiser? Can you hear me now? Yeah. If I turn off my camera, would that be any better? I think that's a good idea. Okay. So I'll go back to the fundraiser. Everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Loud and clearly. Yeah, so after having a conference, conference uh, two, two conferences with the, you know, our community groups of the borough, one thing that, that came forward was that as a, as a small organisation, it's difficult for them to bid for uh, funding out there because a lot of them are volunteers and they, they do this for the love of the community. They don't do it for, the, for you know, to gain thousands of pounds of salaries. And one of the things they said, it's difficult for them to put bids in with the small time they have when they're volunteering so as a council we are going to support by employing a bid writer to actually write the bids for small organizations in the borough sit there explain what needs to go in write the bid with them make sure that they succeed in this bid and help them progress and use that business plan to apply for more funding to continue delivering the great work in our borough and from from the our conversations as well that we realized that it's not only the they needed 
support regarding funding bids, but regarding with governance, there's going to be support with governance and how to write a business plan and stay afloat in these challenging times that we are here because our community groups are really valued and what they deliver is priceless, you know, is completely the most amazing thing and I've seen it firsthand over the years. And the other thing regarding Black History Month, we realised that there needs to be some funding for small organisations in the borough to deliver the work around Black History Month, uh, around Black History Month. There's never been something like that before. As a council, we are committed to work with all groups and we said this month we have to put some money out there. So we had 26 different organisations apply for the funding which was really difficult because all of the applications were brilliant. Uh, the team had a challenging time to work through all the 26 applications. Nine of them were successful. And with the nine, you'll see some amazing work they'll be delivering through the taster sessions this afternoon at two o'clock. And regarding education, so we got a dis panel discussion today around education and the importance of edu educa education within schools. And it's, I think it's one of the most important things that we are doing today for Black History Month. Like I said to you, as a young man in school, I was completely written off. They said, I'm loud and you know, I'm disruptive. That's what it showed in my, in my school report when I was a young kid. And that same thing now is happening to my four-year-old daughter. Exactly the same thing is being put in her report saying, oh, she's loud, she's disruptive, and she's only four. It does, as a father, it breaks my heart. And I think it's important that schools play a major role in this. Major, major role regarding, you know, we should have a black curriculum. We should understand the heritage. And not only the heritage, we have to understand the culture of our BAME and black community. Because if, if our school teachers don't understand it, how would the other students understand it? And I think that's why it's really important this, conference, this panel's gonna have this conversation about this today. I will leave it there and I will hand over to the fantastic Councillor Ivis William will be chairing this panel. And uh, thank you so much for your time and looking forward to working with you more closely. Well, like I said before, my time is your time. So if anytime you need anything, please do let me know. Thank you.